So it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Joe Nye. I, I think he probably doesn't need any introduction, but as is the, the habit of this seminar series, I'll just say a few words. Um, the, he's made a large number of, of uh, foundational intellectual contributions over his career. Indeed, a survey of 17, I thought 100 international relations scholars uh, list Joe in the aggregate as the sixth most important IR scholar ever. Made me wonder who the other five are. Uh, <laughs> among his uh, foundational uh, contributions have been the notion of complex interdependence with Robert Cohen, which leads into uh, very, very important work developing notions of transnationalism, the message of transnationalism. It's not just nation states stupid. Later, after that, um, and a set of ideas that he developed, I think, probably in the 1990s and early 2000s had to do with uh, articulating the notion of governance. And in particular, he develops a nice uh, spatial account in which uh, we used to think of uh, governance as government around the nation state. And um, Joe stressed to all of us in a long series of conversations. Uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School that governance occurs both above and below the level of the nation state in terms of jurisdiction, but also outside of it uh, in the private sector and civil society especially. Uh, more recently, he's developed um, the notion of soft power, another extremely influential idea. Indeed, it would be easier to make a list of what Joe is not interested in or written about than to detail his areas of scholarship and intellectual leadership. Uh, just a few words about his long and illustrious career. He uh, was an undergraduate at Princeton University. Uh, he did a Rhodes Scholarship at Oxford University studying uh, philosophy, politics, and economics. We know that Oxford University is a very wise place. We know this because the name of that program lists the disciplines in order of their importance. First philosophy, <laughs> then politics, and finally <laughs> economics. Uh, and then he took a PhD in government from Harvard University. He's hold, held many positions in government, including Assistant Secretary of Defense in the Clinton administration, served as a professor and then dean of the Harvard Kennedy School uh, when I was hired, Joe was dean. Now he's the dis uh, distinguished uh, service university professor of, the, of Harvard University. Today he's going to offer some reflections on a sub-theme of the ASH seminars this semester, and that is the question of whether or not America's position in the world as an economic, military, and cultural leader, as the economic, military, and cultural leader, is in decline. This topic is of special concern to the Ash Center because, uh, not least, almost implicit in that common thought these days is the second question of who might be the next global leader, and many think the answer to that question is China. So, Joe, what do you think? <laughs> oh, thank you, Archon. It's nice to be here at the Ash Institute. Tony Sage's empire, and uh, uh, it's also a pleasure to be uh, able to see so many friends and, and to be on a panel which, which uh, for the series that uh, Archon has organized, which has been a terrific series. Unfortunately, I've been teaching it fall term on Wednesday, so I, I kept saying, gee, I'd like to go to that. Instead of that, I have to come and work in the spring term. Um, let me... Uh, say a few things about decline, but I want to keep my <laughs> remarks brief enough that uh, we have time for uh, some questions and answers, in fact, most of the time. Um, there's a lot of attention to this issue of American decline now. It's a political year, uh, and it's one of the charges that the Republican candidates universally adhere to, which is that Obama accepts decline as presiding over decline and so forth, and um, one could be uh, um, worried about that, but uh, uh, we've been through this before, and so one has to have a little perspective on it. It's interesting to me that uh, Robert Kagan has just brought out a book on decline, which was reviewed by Michio Kakutani, I guess, in the Times yesterday, he gave a rather negative review, but apparently he's going to do very well because uh, according to press accounts, Obama found the fact that a neoconservative advisor to Romney was saying that Obama was not a declinist was good for Obama. So, but, so I think uh, even though I wrote a book last year called The Future of Power, which has a large section on decline, I think Kagan's going to outsell me by far. And I, if I could just get the kind of props that he has for, for his uh, publication, I think he'd be much better off. Um, 
if one asks why should we care about decline, uh, in addition to the fact that it cuts across some of the themes of our series, uh, it's uh, basically uh, something which in political science there's a long tradition of, of worrying about. One, one is there are two theories that political scientists use to try to think about the implication of design. One is decline. One is called hegemonic transition theory. The other is hegemonic stability theory. Uh, hegemonic transition theory, Bob Gilpin, uh, Princeton made an argument uh, 20, 30 years ago saying that unequal growth uh, is the cause of major change in international politics. And um, it, it, it's not an original idea with Gilpin. It goes back about 2,500 years. I remember when Thucydides was trying to answer the question of why did the Greek city-state system tear itself apart? Um, and he said the Peloponnesian War was caused by the rise in the power of Athens and the fear it created in Sparta. And many people say that answers the question of why did the European state system tear itself apart in the beginning of the 20th century and ceased to be the center of the world and is the rise in the power of Germany and the fear it created in Britain. And there are some people, like John Mearsheimer at uh, Chicago and others, who predict that this will be something similar in the 21st century, that there's going to be a conflict between the U.S. and China. And that I suppose you'd say that the story of the 21st century will be the rise in the power of China and the fear it creates in the U.S. I'm going to explain later why I think that's wrong, but at least that lays out a line of thought, hegemonic transition which has had you know, a significant influence over the years. The other uh, reason that people are concerned about the relative decline in terms of international implications is hegemonic stability. Charlie Kindleberger, the MIT economist, uh, who was very one of the economists who really thought about politics beyond just narrow economic models. And Kindleberger did some interesting work on uh, the 1930s and the Great Depression. And he said, you know, what you really need is not balanced power. What you need is uneven power. And the, the world works best when there's one country a lot stronger than the rest. And that country then solves the problem of provision of public goods. We know from general theories of public goods that they tend to be underprovided because if everybody is equal in size, and you're going to chip in and provide a public good, clean air, public safety, whatever, uh, everybody else is going to free ride. Why should, why should anybody provide it when you're not going to, you know, if, if free riding is such a better answer under any prisoner's dilemma model of the world. And uh, uh, so that there's no incentive to provide public goods. But if one country is a lot larger than the rest, or one member of a group doesn't have any country, is a lot larger than then they are going to consume a large part of the public good that they produce. And that fact that they will get some return on their investment leads them to invest in public goods. So in the 19th century, for example, uh, Britain supported freedom of the seas, or it supported a, a relatively open international trading system, or a relatively stable monetary system with the gold standard. Uh, it was good for Britain. It was good for the rest of the world. It was a global public good. Britain didn't do it out of the goodness of its heart. It did it because it was such a large preponderant power, a hegemon as it's sometimes called, that, um, that it was in its interest to provide the public good. And the argument that Kindleberger makes is that Britain was providing this public good in the 19th century and in the beginning of the 20th century, but with World War I, uh, it no longer could do so. I mean, it, it, by world, the United States passes Britain in overall economic size by the 1880s or so. I mean, it's in terms of industrial production. It, it, but it doesn't become clear that the Americans are the preeminent uh, power uh, in terms of economic power until uh, after World War I, when the British are, are basically have liquidated so many of their investments to pay for the war and uh, are in pretty tough shape. And Kindleberger says at this point, Britain no longer could afford to provide these 
public goods, these global public goods. Uh, and the country that could afford it was the United States. But the United States was still thinking like a small country, and it still saw itself as a free rider. And so the Americans didn't step in in Britain's place to produce these public goods, and the net effect of that was nobody provided them. So nobody kept an open international monetary or trade system. The result is you got in the 1930s, the, the Great Depression, with all the problems that that created. Um, and, you know, after World War II, with the establishment of the Bretton Woods institutions and so forth, the Americans finally do step up to their, to their role as the largest power and begin to provide some global public good, but uh, only after a disastrous period of the 1930s. And many people say that will be the story of the 21st century, that China will pass the United States in total power, but China will, like the United States in the 1920s, still consider itself uh, a free rider. And if you listen to Chinese statements today, like why doesn't China do more on climate change, on monetary stability, on rebalancing the world economy, and so forth, the answer you hear from Chinese, we're a developing country. You know, we, we can't afford to do that. We're still, we're still a developing country. And so that would be a model of hegemonic, for hegemonic stability theory, of why it matters whether the U.S. keeps a preponderant position or not, that, uh, that China is not ready. Even if, if China passes the U.S. in total economic size, which it probably will sometime in this uh, uh, coming decade, uh, China is not ready in terms of its internal politics and attitudes to essentially fill the role that Kindleberger wants, wants a hedge of it to fill. But before we go on, let me just caution you for a minute. Even though hegemonic <coughs> transition and hegemonic stability theory are, are two of the more powerful uh, propositions we have in, uh, in our weak science of international politics, uh, the word hegemony or hegemony is often very poorly specified. Um, people tend to think of hegemony as, as being able to do what you want, and it's not. Um, some people define hegemony in terms of power uh, resources, that a country has a preponderance of power resources. Other define, others define it in terms of being able to set the rules or to sort of maintain the game. It's terribly important to realize, and this is one of the things I argue in chapter one of this book, The Future of Power, don't confuse power defined as resources with power defined as behavior. So even if a country has preponderant resources, doesn't mean it's able to get the outcomes of lots of behavioral terms. If you don't agree with that, just think for a minute about the 19, period from 1945 to, let's say, the early 50s. If the United States wasn't a hegemon then, I don't know when it was. In, 19, in that period, in the first decade after World War II, the U.S., by some accounts, produced almost half the world's product because everybody else had been laid low by the war. Uh, it had sole possession of nuclear weapons for the first four years after the war. Uh, and it had vast armies which it had built up during World War II. And so if you just did a calculation of power resources, you'd see that the Americans were presumably a hegemon. Then ask what happened in that period. Was the U.S. able to prevent the so-called loss of China to the Chinese communists. No, uh, that was a major defeat uh, for the hegemon. Was the US able to prevent the Soviet Union, its arch rival, from getting nuclear weapons and breaking its nuclear monopoly? No. Was the US able to prevent the North Koreans from crossing the 38th parallel into South Korea? No. Was it then able to repel China from the North part of North Korean Peninsula, of the Korean Peninsula, uh, after China crossed the Yalu in November of 1950? No. This was the hegemon. Hegemons are supposed to get what they want. And so today, when people say, look, how American power has declined, we can't get Iran to stop making a nuclear weapon. Uh, we can't get Cuba, right, 90 miles off our shore, 
to stop being communist. We, you know, look at the things, how bad it is that we can't do all these things. You know, this is a story of terrible decline. Where is American hegemony gone? And you know, it's like that joke about uh, we ain't what we used to be, but then we never were, were we? And so be careful about the world word hegemony. It's, it's poorly defined in many cases and, and rather loosely used. But with that little comment on political science or in international political theory, let me go back to current uh, uh, situations and polls. There was a poll by the uh, uh, Pew uh, uh, organization last year in which it found that of the 22 countries it surveyed, 15 of the 22 believed that China had either replaced the United States as the leading superpower or would soon replace the United States as the leading superpower. That's quite an extraordinary statement. And uh, it, it's an indication of something which is a conventional wisdom. I mean, as you pick up newspapers, you'll find people uh, making these propositions all the time. Um, but one thing to remember as, as you read polls like that is uh, that it's not too surprising. For example, uh, in, if you look at Americans, Americans have consistently uh, gone through periods of believing they're in decline. And it goes in sort of cycles, roughly decade-long cycles. In, in the 1950s, at the end of the 50s, after the Soviets launched Sputnik, um, the U.S. thought the United States was in decline. Um, and the Russians were 10 feet tall in, the, in, in that period. Uh, if you look at the period after Nixon closed the gold window uh, and the oil uh, shock from the Arab oil embargo, uh, in the, by the mid to late 70s, there was a belief that the United States had declined. Remember, Nixon and Kissinger, when they had the original opening to China, were thinking of regional measures to, to balance for the loss of American power, that America was in decline. They actually said this and believed it. Uh, if you look at the uh, 1980s, um, in the 1980s, you had uh, the hollowing out of the American industrial heartland, the so-called Rust Belt. And uh, you, know, you had uh, the Reagan deficits, and there was a great feeling that the United States for all Reagan's cheerfulness uh, that the United States was in decline. This was the period when uh, Paul Kennedy wrote his famous book, The Rise and Fall of the Great Powers. And uh, Kennedy, a uh, uh, very distinguished uh, professor at Yale, a nice friend, I like him very much. But Kennedy um, said the United States is going to go the way of uh, Philip II Spain or you know, Edwardian Britain, uh, this is you know, where we are. We're suffering from imperial overstretch. And this is the story. I wrote a book um, uh, in 1990 called Bound to Lead, saying I didn't think the United States was in decline. Uh, and I gave various reasons why I thought that was the case. And I think that I got the answer right, but Paul Kennedy got all the royalties. He was, you know, the, his book really sold mine was for academics. Um, so the, the, the cycles of belief in American decline, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't 10 years after Paul was on the top of the New York Times bestseller list that you had somebody like Charles Krauthammer promoting the opposite sort of nonsense, which was the United States is so strong that it could do whatever it wanted and nobody had any choice but to follow. So we, you know, we go through these extraordinary cycles of perception, and I would say misperception, of the reality of American power. So when you read something like this Pew poll, you know, that everybody thinks we're declining, uh, you've got to take it with a certain grain of salt. I've been seen this before. The danger is when people base policy on it. And one policy that I think was based on this was the, the uh, policy that China began to follow in uh, after the financial crisis of 2008. I think a number of Chinese uh, in some in a variety of bureaucracies, I don't think it was necessary Hu Jintao or Wen Jibao, but a number of Chinese 
believe that, the, and particularly in the PLA, I would say, believe that the Americans, the 2008 financial crisis showed that the Americans now had passed their peak and were in decline. And um, I was at a meeting in, in Washington on the, uh, at the State Department on Monday night, which was to uh, have a discussion in preparation for the, the uh, Xi Jinping visit. And it was a group of people who were brought in as outside experts. And I would say the preponderant view, doesn't mean they're right, but the preponderant view about these people who are experts about China was that uh, China miscalculated that the U.S. was in decline, and it departed from Deng Xiaoping's advice and took a much more assertive foreign policy. And for the next two years, as it brought about worse relations between China and the U.S., but worse relations between China and Japan, China and India, you name it, China and South Korea. Uh, after two years of that, China said, you know, I don't think this is working. And uh, at Hu Jintao's visit to Washington a year ago now, I think uh, by then the Chinese had made a decision that they ought to go back to Deng Xiaoping's advice, and that uh, maybe the Americans weren't so finished after all. And I think that uh, is an illustration, though, of why misperceptions of decline uh, can lead to policies which can be quite expensive or quite difficult. Uh, so then you have the question of, of uh, what, so this is the answer to the question of why does it matter whether we either are in decline or think, or people think we're in decline. Um, the other thing is that I would say is that decline is not a very useful word for describing power transitions. In my book, The Future of Power, I argue there are two great power transitions occurring, or two great power shifts at the beginning of the 20th century. One I call the power transition of the shift of the world economy center from the west to the east. And you might call this the recovery of Asia. Essentially, Asia, by the middle of this century, will go back to about the proportions of half the world's product and half the world's population that it held before the Industrial Revolution created the oddity of Europe and North America having uh, this disproportionate role that they had in the 20th century. That's a good thing. It means hundreds of millions of people are being lifted out of poverty. It means that uh, uh, you're going to have a, a better world economy overall. Um, but it does uh, uh, lead to anxieties because of the, what I said earlier about hegemonic transition. But that shift, that power shift from west to east, is one of the great power shifts of this 21st century. And probably by the middle of this century, that will be, be completed as India reaches the same levels that, that China is. Um, the other great power shift that's going on, though, I would argue is away from all governments to non-state actors. And that's fomented by the information revolution, and it's going to be East and West. And I'm not going to discuss that much today, but I think it'd be a mistake to forget that there are these two shifts that are going on at the same time. In any case, the, the, the using the metaphor of decline as a way to understand the power shifts of this century, uh, I think confuses us. It, it, you know, it's, it, anytime you find all political candidates jumping on a metaphor, you should think maybe there's something wrong with it as an analytical concept. Let me, let me notice a couple of things. There are at least three reasons that I think it's a bad metaphor. First of all, it, it tends to have an organic connotation. It has, tends to give you the sense that, uh, you know, this is, this is just a natural process. It's inescapable. And uh, the problem with that is it's not, states are not organic. If you take um, me, a non-state actor, I am definitely in decline. I assure you. <laughs> <laughs> There's no question about it. I'd like to deny it, but it's, it's it. But if you take a country, we don't know what a life cycle looks like. For example, in the uh, uh, end of the 18th uh, uh, century, uh, Horace Walpole, uh, after Britain had lost its North American colonies, Horace Walpole said, woe is Britain. 
we're now reduced to a miserable little country like Sardinia or Denmark. Well, with all apologies to Sardinians and Danes who are here, uh, Walpole was badly wrong. He said this on the eve of Britain's greatest century, which was created by the Industrial Revolution. And so this sort of view that, uh, that you can tell the life cycle of a country is simply wrong, and it can get you into a lot of trouble. So the decline metaphor, if you think of it in organic terms, is, is highly misleading. The second problem with the decline metaphor, it doesn't tell you anything about time. And time makes a big difference. We talk, you know, Gibbon wrote about the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. And uh, we often find in these op-ed pieces that people pass or toss off every other week or two about American decline, a reference to Imperial Rome or something like that. People forget it took Rome 300 years to get from its, its apogee power to its final collapse in 476. And, uh, you know, well, if we can get another 300 years out of this old country of ours, I wouldn't be too bad. But in any case, the, the point is that we don't know what time looks like. Now, there are some people who take just the opposite view. Our colleague, Neil Ferguson, uh, has uh, said declines will be sudden. And uh, it's an interesting side note here. I told you you'll enjoy this. And every decade or two, Britain sends us a Cassandra, a brilliant, a brilliant historian to chastise the chasing the Americans. And first it was Paul Kennedy, now it's Neil Ferguson. Remember, Neil wrote this article, what was it, a year ago, said America is Greece. You know, we're, we're given the problems of the dollar and our debt, we're Greece. Well, you know, I think he didn't get that one right. But, but, uh, but there is this role of the, the wise British historian who tells the colonials they shouldn't have left after all. In any case, the, the, uh, there is the problem of how do you think about time. Neil would say, and has written, that uh, uh, declines happen suddenly. And you can think of sudden declines. After World War I, three empires declined rapidly, but because of World War I. Uh, and whereas if you look at Britain, the British decline, you can date it different ways. But if you say that uh, from World War at the end, say from 1918 to uh, when Britain gave up its position in the Eastern Mediterranean at the time of the Truman Doctrine, or a little later when it gave up east of Suez in the 1960s, it's about a half century uh, for, for the decline. Uh, if you take um, the Soviet Union, the Soviet Union um, declined in about a quarter of a century. Uh, you know, the Soviets, had, when Khrushchev came to America in the 1950s and said, we will bury you, a lot of Americans believed it because the Soviet growth rate then was higher than the American growth rate. The Soviets were then benefiting from replacement of all the heavy industry that had been destroyed in World War II. And they had a very impressive growth rate while we were limping along at 2 to 3%, which is our long-term average. And what you see is that there was a wide belief that uh, the Soviets were the wave of the future. Never, uh, there was a strong belief that Khrushchev, when he said, we will bury you, uh, meaning it economically, that he was right. Um, but it's interesting that by the 1980s, um, uh, which is about a quarter of a century between those two dates, the Soviets had not coped with the third industrial revolution, the, basically the information revolution. And they had this difficult old planning system that was all thumbs and no fingers, and they couldn't they couldn't keep up. And that was really the you know, I suppose you could have kept Norbert if, if Andropov had lived, the tough old KGB type. I suppose you could have spun out the the uh, Soviet Union for another ten or twenty years. But by and large, the Soviet fate was over by by uh, by the eighties, so a quarter of a century there. The point is that. He, he, because of these great variations of how long it takes countries or empires to decline, we don't know what decline looks like. It reinforces my point, this is not an organic cycle. This is not something where you can predict it. And the third point I would make about this is that um, there's a big difference between absolute and relative decline. The word decline conflates these two ideas. Um, Absolute decline is 
uh, what happened to Rome. And if you look at what happened to Rome, what's interesting is it wasn't relative to another state. It was absolute. Rome wasn't replaced by the rise of another empire. It uh, basically succumbed to hordes of barbarians. <coughs> because it was racked by internecine warfare and had no productivity growth. Rome expanded economically by capturing other areas rather than having internal productivity growth through science and technology. And uh, so while it did last a long time, it was a model which essentially uh, succumbed to, to absolute decline because there was no productivity growth. Uh, so that's, an, that's what absolute decline is. Relative decline is, as the word says, something that represents the rise of another country. But the rise of another country, or of many other countries, doesn't necessarily mean that they will pass the leading country or the hegemon, if you want to use those terms. So for example, if the United States is here in uh, 1950 and China is here, and China now is here, you'd say you could either describe that as the rise of China, or the, if you want to generalize it beyond China, to and others, the rise of the rest, doesn't mean that China will necessarily pass the United States. It might or it might not. You can either describe that narrowing of the gap as the rise of the rest, or you can describe it as relative decline in the U.S. But relative decline doesn't tell you one country will pass another. And so the terminology that we use of decline, whether absolute or relative, often gets us into a lot of trouble. So if somebody says to me, is the America, is the United States in decline, I would say I don't think it's an absolute decline. But if you want to measure it by the narrowing of the gap, very clearly the numbers are there. It's a relative decline. People say, oh my god, isn't that awful? I said, no, not necessarily. There's no proof that China is going to pass the U.S. We don't know that. So uh, that's, that's why we have to be very careful about the terminology. We'd be better off if we didn't use the terms decline. Um, but, you know, we're stuck with it. It's a bit like hegemony. Uh, that, we're, that the discourse has already been set. Now, is the United States in absolute decline? Let me pick, there are lots of people who argue it is. Um, let me pick just one because I think he's one of the most interesting and sensitive commentators we have in the U.S. now, which is Fareed Zakaria, former student here, uh, well known to any of you who watch CNN and read Time Magazine, and um, a, a very sensible, thoughtful, man who has the advantage of perspective of being born in India before he came to Harvard, got his PhD, and lost his perspective. But, uh, <laughs> the, uh, but Freed's a close friend, so that's just a, just a side comment on Harvard. Um, Freed wrote a, set of, he wrote a very interesting book uh, uh, called The Post-American World. And that post-American world book actually was more optimistic about America didn't see America in absolute decline, and said it's, it's the rise of the rest. And he should have titled the book The Rise of the Rest, and it would have been fine. Um, but he called it the post-American world, which I don't think is right. But in any case, more recently, after the 2008 financial crisis and the problems the Americans have run into with their, their debt and the uh, politics, political system, he has become more skeptical. And so he had a long essay in Time Magazine and uh, a piece of foreign policy and others, in which he said there are some signs that uh, suggest absolute decline. And among the ones that he listed were that, uh, uh, well, there's the obvious one that everybody talks about, the national debt of the current projections by the Congressional Budget Office will be equal to our GDP in a decade, and that will undermine confidence in the dollar. And everybody talks about that one. But he then talks about some others. He said Americans, according to the OECD, American 15-year-olds rank 17th in the world of science and 25th in math. Americans are 12th in college graduation rates, 23rd in infrastructure, and 27th in life expectancy. Um, and those are very real problems uh, that he's pointing out as symptoms of absolute decline. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's also worth noticing that it's a mixed picture. The uh, U.S. is also first in total R&D expenditure.
first in university rankings, first in Nobel Prizes, and first on indices of entrepreneurship. And according to the World Economic Forum, uh, the fifth most competitive economy in the world, behind the small states of Switzerland, Sweden, and Singapore. Um, and when you compare that with China, China comes out about 27th on the, on the Davos ranking. Um, Moreover, the United States remains at the forefront of such new technologies of the future as biotechnology and nanotechnology. It strikes me this is not a picture of absolute economic decay like ancient Rome. Does the United States have a lot of problems? Absolutely. Do we have to do something about it? Yes. Are these indices of absolute decline? I would say it's not proven there. You can paint this picture bright colors or dull colors, but it's certainly not a clear picture of absolute decline. Now, Zakaria goes on, <coughs> follows the, uh, the very interesting political economist Mansur Olson, in saying that societies become sclerotic over time as bureaucracies develop and political processes become more difficult. Uh, and, he, and he says American society and culture is becoming sclerotic. Um, indeed, the analogy is often made to Britain. In the 19th century, Britain was uh, you know, dynamic in industry. But if you were the son of a mill owner who made a lot of money in Britain, what did you want to do? You didn't want to go out and start another mill. You wanted to buy a big piece of property and marry into somebody who had a bit of a title and get into London society. I mean, the, the whole orientation of Britain was directed by the nature of that culture with its, with its hierarchical aristocratic background. If Olson is right, then the solution uh, to the problem that uh, Britain ran into is, is uh, stay flexible. And if you ask, is America staying flexible? Well, in one sense, no. We're growing, our growing inequality is a reduction of flexibility. But that's the bad news. The good news is immigration. While we protest all the time against immigration, immigration is bringing in new blood, which is making us more flexible all the time. And uh, if you uh, uh, look at the number of Silicon Valley startups that have been created by immigrants from Asia, China, and India, it's about a third, which is quite extraordinary. Uh, this is a huge gain that we have. Indeed, uh, I remember uh, talking with Lee Kuan Yew about this at one time, and, and I said, what do you think? Uh, do you think that the China is going to pass the United States? He said, no, they're going to give you a run for your money. He said, I doubt they'll pass you. I said, well, that's interesting. Why? And he said, because, you know, China can draw upon the talents of 1.3 billion people. And there's some very talented people in 1.3 billion. He said, but the United States can draw on the talents of 7 billion people. And he said, as long as you do that, and as long as you keep recombining them in diverse ways, you can do things that are much more creative than is ever permitted within the limits of ethnic Han nationalism. I thought that was an interesting insight. So if we are able to resist the folly of cutting ourselves off from this enormous source of strength for this country, uh, I think uh, uh, Lee Kuan Yew may turn out to be right that we'll escape the Mansur Olson trap just because we're not a centralized uh, society like London centralized Britain in the 19th century. And we keep getting these new infusions of talent from all over the world uh, all the time. So I'm not, uh, I, I don't think we're going to see absolute decline. Now, there's one more argument of that Fareed makes, which is, yes, but the American political system. You know, maybe you can get through with the social and economic questions, but the political system is a disaster. It's totally blocked. It's an 18th century constitution. It's unworkable, so forth. And that's true, but also the way the Founding Fathers designed it. I mean, they deliberately created an inefficient political system because they didn't care about efficiency. They cared about liberty. They wanted to create a government which uh, 
would make it sure that King George couldn't rule over us again, nor could anybody else. <coughs> and uh, we've got it. Uh, and people say, yes, but, uh, you know, it's so nasty. The politics have turned so bad. And before you succumb to that, I agree that politics right now are going through a very nasty spell. I don't admire it at all. Uh, but it's worth going back to read a little bit about the relations between Hamilton and Burr and Madison and Jefferson and Adams and the way they suborned the press to make their points. I mean, it, it makes current politics look like, indeed, the politics of the Founding Fathers, for better and for worse. Um, I think, in fact, what we are living through, and this is something that we put into this book that the Kennedy School did a few years ago on why people don't trust government. Uh, the real anomaly, uh, as Bob Putnam and others have pointed out, was overconfidence in government in the 1950s and the 1960s. Government had helped us get through the Great Depression, and it helped us get through with World War II. And there was a generation that just had a lot of confidence in government. This really starts to taper off in the 60s, and the actions in Vietnam uh, and uh, Watergate basically are a sharp turning point, so that when you look at trends in polls, you see high levels of confidence in government up to let's say 70 or 70, somewhere in that range. They start to taper off after 64. And then it goes up and down and up and down. Now it's at a down. But it isn't monotonic. I mean, it's, you know, we live along like this. But what's most interesting that we discovered in this book was despite the loss of confidence in government as people expound their views to pollsters who ask them questions, you don't see a significant change in behavior. You don't see a change in people's paying of their taxes. You don't see a change of people filling out their census forms. Now, there's a lot of other things of behavioral indices of changing. Even here's Alex, who knows more about voting than I ever will. But, but uh, even in voting, it goes up and down. But the last cycle has been slightly up. I mean, and so we, we, you know, behavioral, if you take the poll lines of loss of confidence in government, and you take the behavioral lines, they don't track each other. And that tells you something else, which is that some of what we're going through on this loss of confidence in government is uh, it's a mediated phenomenon. It's now the new conventional wisdom which is passed to each other that you know we can't trust these people at all. But behaviorally, if you look at the things I just mentioned, plus uh, charitable giving, community service, and so forth, it's it, you know the place is really not going to hell in a handbasket. So I would argue that uh, this is not a sign of, of uh, uh, absolute decline, even politically. Now, some people say, well, yes, but can, it's, it's all relative. And you compare this to the really efficient political system of China. Uh, how can we keep limping along with this 18th century system? And I don't know. You know, is the political system of China really that efficient? Have they solved the problem of succession? Have they solved the problem of participation? As they get richer, people want to participate more. It's not clear to me that China has solved the problem of increased demands for participation. India was born with a constitution which gave some solutions to participation, far from perfect. China doesn't have that yet. What's more, for all that people talk about this wonderful efficiency of the political process in China, it, people forget that when it comes to things like infrastructure, it's far easier to build high-speed rail when there's weak property rights and few lawyers than, uh, than the opposite. But it's also true that you get something like the Wenzhou accident, uh, which is a, a, a downplaying of safety by politicians and bureaucrats and others who are being paid for some things and not other things. Uh, or similarly, if you take a, a larger question like the 12th five-year plan, which is to reduce dependence on exports and shift internal demand and reduce the regional inequality by moving the industry west of China. Um, you know, the 12th five-year plan strikes me as a very good plan, but I don't notice that it's being implemented very quickly. And when I ask some of my Chinese friends why, and what they tell me is because the political power of the party bosses and the industrial state-owned industry on the coast 
is so great that we can't fully implement it. It's got to be slow. And that sounds to me a lot like democracy. I mean, it's not democracy, but when we complain about the sclerotic problems of pressure groups in our system, it sounds to me like China has some as well. And one more evidence of this is if you look at the control of the military, which is a central feature of any successful political system, China has full control, the party has full control of the military politically, but it doesn't have control operationally. Let me give you an example. When China shot down a satellite, the foreign ministry didn't know about this. When Robert Gates met with Hu Jintao last year, about this time last year, uh, and China tested, or the PLA tested the stealth fighter. Gates has told me he thought Hu Jintao didn't know about this. In the United States, we have a National Security Council, which when I was in the Defense Department, we were going to hold an exercise or do something. We had to go to the White House and get permission from the NSC just to check that we weren't drink doubling over each other. Uh, China doesn't have a National Security Council, and this, the, the Central Military Committee doesn't play that role. I asked a Chinese friend, well, why don't you have a, a National Security Council if you have such efficient government? He said, because no single leader on the Standing Committee is willing to give that much power to another leader. Now, this doesn't strike me as a system that's a lot more efficient than the American system. It strikes me as a system where both of us should worry about our ability to control and manage a process. In any case, let me finish by, by just by, uh, just saying that uh, why do I think that China is not necessarily going to pass the United States? Well, it depends on what you mean by passing. If you mean, will the overall size of China's GDP be larger than the American GDP? I would say yes, absolutely. When you have 2. Point, I mean, 1.3 million multiplied by a growth rate of you know, 7 to 9 to 10 percent, uh, those curves are going to intersect. So China will terms of its economic power that it derives from size be larger than the United States relatively soon. Um, the economist, I think, in the last estimate of this put it at about 2019. Um, and there's this fellow Arvin Subramani in the Peterson Institute who said it's already happened. I don't know how he gets there, but it's a bit of focus, focus. But, but uh, if, you, if you ask, will China be bigger than the U.S.? Absolutely. Will China, though, be more powerful economically? Not necessarily. Size is part of it, but a better measure of the sophistication of an economy is its production of high technology goods, or if you want, its per capita income, and which are those two are very highly correlated, uh, unless you're an oil company, or oil country. And uh, what you see there is that most estimates say that China won't equal the U.S per capita GDP until the middle of the century in then. So it's, a, it's quite a distance to go. Um, the other thing to look at is that a lot of these projections of China passing the U.S. are based just on absolute total size of GDP. In fact, uh, there are other dimensions of power. For example, military power. Uh, military power may be less important than the 19th century it's still important. And if you ask, will China be equal to the United States in military power? Uh, not for quite some time. Even with double-digit growth in the defense budget in China, uh, it's the long, long distance between having one aircraft carrier, sort of a starter carrier, and having 11 carrier battle groups. And it's just not, I mean, China's military capacity to keep America away from its coast, to cause America problems, and, South China Sea, that will increase. But global military capacity is a long way off. And the third uh, dimension of power is, is uh, uh, soft power, the ability to get what you want, not through uh, coercion or payment, but through attraction and persuasion. And there, uh, China has been spending huge amounts to increase its soft power. Hu Jintao told the 17th Party Congress in 2007 that uh, China needed to spend more on its soft power. And uh, it is spending billions and billions of dollars on soft power. 
David Shambwa has a new book coming out with a chapter, 80 pages or so, on China's investments in soft power. He's very impressive research he's done, and the money that China's spending. The problem is that China doesn't understand that a lot of American soft power comes not from government, but from civil society. And when I've gone to China and made that point, uh, they can accept it intellectually. It's hard to accept politically, because it means the party letting go of its tight control <coughs> of civil society. So I, I often use the example of the film industry in China and India. I said, look, India does so much better with Bollywood than China does with its film industry internationally. Why is that? Is it because Indian directors and actors actresses are better? Of course not. It's because India doesn't have censors, and you do. And you can make that point, but if you say, now what do you do about it? It's just very hard. China tends to conflate soft power with public diplomacy. If I set up a, a CCTV which rivals Al Jazeera, I'm investing billions in soft power. No, you're investing billions of dollars in a resource which promotes government views doesn't necessarily produce soft power if what it sells is not credible. So I think that China is not going to equal the U.S. in soft power for quite some time until you see a change in the political system that allows civil society to play a larger role. And I think that's not about to happen soon. And then finally, in terms of power balances, you have to think of the ability of countries to create networks and to create alliances. And there, I think the Americans also have an advantage. I talked about the recovery of Asia. It's not one thing. Asia has many different countries. And as China rises more rapidly than others, it creates fear in its neighbors, which is an old, this is political science 101 or international politics 101. And that's why Hu Jintao is so smart to say we should increase our soft power so that we don't threaten others. But the trouble is that it doesn't work out that way. And China, if you look at its relations with, I guess it's what, 14 countries on its border and other six that are near ocean uh, neighbors, China has bad relations with most of them, except for ones like Myanmar and North Korea, and Pakistan. But most of the ones that you would care most about, India, uh, South Korea, Japan, Vietnam, have, relations have gotten worse, not better. And I've often said that that is a little bit analogous to a situation where in the United States, um, you found that Mexico and Canada were asking for a Chinese alliance to balance American power. And we don't see that. So <laughs> basically, I think China has a, 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 a structural situation in terms of networks and alliances. So if you put those all together, Per capita GDP, military power, soft power, and this ability to create networks and alliances, I don't see China passing the US. Now you might say, why does that matter? What's you know, is or so what the reason it matters is if you go back to my analogy of World War One, Britain had been passed by Germany by 1900, 14 years before the war. If China's not about to pass the United States in overall power, it means we have a lot more time. We can manage this relationship without succumbing to the second half of Thucydides' causal proposition. Remember, it was the rise of the power of Athens and the fear it created in Sparta. Or another way of putting this is too much fear of China could become a self-fulfilling prophecy. We could get ourselves worked up into such a situation because we think China has just passed us or is about to pass us, that we greatly overreact. Instead, if China has a realistic assessment of the fact that the Americans are not thinking about it, and the United States has a realistic assessment of the rise of China and the narrowing of the gap and the growing closeness of China, but knows that there's still a lot of time to manage this relationship, then you can imagine a happy outcome of U.S.-China relations. Uh, it's a relationship which is a mixture of competition and cooperation, but we both have a strong interest 
in the cooperation part of it. The great danger is we focus only on the competition. We think only of power over. Does the hegemon or the rising power have power over the other? Many of the things that we care most about, international financial stability, climate change, dealing with pandemics, <coughs> you can't get the outcomes you want dealing alone. You have to do them with others. And one of the others we have to work with is China. So we think of power with as well as power over and realize we're going to have to play a zero sum and a positive sum game simultaneously. Then I think we will be able to manage this relationship. And too much talk about hegemonic transition or inevitable decline can interfere with what I think is a sensible way to manage this relative change in the relations of the US and China.